Welcome to All Out Physiology. This is my new channel and today we're going to talk about thresholds and intensity domains. Now the problem I'm going to try and address in this video is what to call metabolic thresholds and this was sparked by a discussion I had with James Sprague about three months ago where he tweeted that it amazes him that training platforms only focus on anaerobic threshold completely ignore the aerobic threshold as if it doesn't exist or isn't important. Uh, at which point, being the combative person I am, I said both terms are physiologically meaningless and outdated, but I somehow know what you mean. Um, and with any discussion, of course, you come up with an absolute zinger of a take about three months after you've had it. So this is my zinger of a take. And the first thing I want to point out is that as Richard Feynman once said, knowing the name of something isn't the same as knowing anything about it. And so the name of the aerobic, anaerobic threshold, whatever you want to call it, is a little bit muddy. And by muddy, I mean there are many different names for effectively the same thing or the same things. So we have the aerobic threshold, the anaerobic threshold, the lactate threshold, the ventilatory threshold, the gas exchange threshold, the 1 millimolar delta threshold, the 2.5 millimolar and 4 millimolar fixed lactate values, the onset of blood lactate accumulation, the onset of plasma lactate accumulation, the DMAX method to determine the lactate threshold, and the modified DMAX method, the lactate turn point, the lactate minimum point, the maximal lactate steady state, critical power, critical speed, critical torque, critical force, etc, etc. The respiratory compensation point, the heart rate deflection point, the respiratory fre frequency deflection point, lactate threshold 1, lactate threshold 2, VT1, VT2, and so on and so forth. What I'm going to do in this presentation is argue that there are really two thresholds that we really need to know about, and the reason for that is what we're trying to do is separate regions of the exercise intensity response into exercise intensity domains. And these are the physiological responses you typically find if you do constant load exercise at different intensities. So at the bottom, with the black circles, we have moderate intensity exercise. And if you start exercise at time zero, down here, what will happen is your oxygen uptake will begin to rise and eventually it will plateau out. So there's an exponential increase or an exponential decay, I should say, in the VO2 response. And after two to three minutes, you'll reach a steady state. So classical exercise, physiological steady state, that's your moderate intensity domain. With the white circles, you can see the heavy intensity domain. And here, there's a slightly different thing going on. So you get the same rise in VO2. It's larger because it's a higher exercise intensity. So you're running at a higher speed or cycling at a higher power output. And the oxygen uptake response doesn't reach a steady state in two to three minutes. It takes 10 to 15 minutes to reach a steady state, but eventually it will reach that steady state and you'll be achieving a submaximal VO2. So the delayed steady state is caused by a thing we call the VO2 slow component. And I'll mention the VO2 slow component in another presentation another time. And then we have severe intensity exercises with the black triangles. And you can see here, there is no steady state whatsoever. An exercise finishes before 20 minutes. In this case, it's finished after about 12 minutes and maximal oxygen uptake has been attained. So severe intensity exercise is non-steady state. So what do we use to separate out these exercise intensity domains? I should point out there is a fourth intensity domain, extreme intensity exercise, which is differentiated from severe intensity exercise in that you become exhausted or you reach task failure too soon to achieve VO2 max. So these bouts of exercise last substantially less than two minutes and you don't achieve the same endpoint VO2. But in terms of metabolic thresholds, we don't use a metabolic threshold to demarcate severe and extreme exercise, but we do to demarcate moderate, heavy and severe exercise. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So the moderate heavy domain boundary is the first thing we're going to talk about. And the fundamental measure of that is what we might call the lactate threshold. So what we've got here is a plot of an exercise test where we've done four minute stages. 
and we simply increase the power output by 20 or 25 watts each stage. And what you can see there is when you start exercise, you get a blood lactate response of uh, around the resting level. And it stays around the resting level as you increase exercise intensity, as you increase the power output, until you reach a point where there is a sudden and sustained increase in blood lactate concentration. And that occurs here uh, beyond 275 watts. And as you carry on increasing, the lactate response accelerates. And you might say, well, here you see uh, a further deviation in the curve. And that might be what you call the lactate turn point. You don't always see that, but uh, that can sometimes be identified. But the lactate threshold is what we're really interested in here. And that's fairly easy to spot because that is, of course, how all lactate thresholds look. <laughs> Not at all, actually. Um, the lactate threshold can sometimes be very difficult to spot, and that's why you need to have two independent assessors looking at these lactate responses so that you can get agreement between the two of them. And sometimes you don't get agreement at all. But there are other ways of actually measuring this lactate threshold, or at least estimating it. And you can do that from gas exchange. And one of the ways of doing that is by looking at the ventilatory response. Now, you don't really see a threshold in here. This is minute ventilation against time. Uh, that's where exercise starts. And then you can see up to v, the, the ventilatory threshold, or VT1, as we might call it. And then we can see a rise, further rise in ventilation up to the respiratory compensation point, sometimes called VT2. And then there's a further deviation, a further kink in the curve, if you like. But you can see they're very, very difficult to identify that visually. And the only reason I've managed to do that is because I've done it in a different way. And the way I've done that is to use ventilatory equivalents. And so here you see a plot of the ventilatory equivalents response to exercise. So now you see uh, minute ventilation is divided by VO2 or divided by VCO2. So the black dots, that's VVO2 white dots V, V, C, O, 2. And you can see that as exercise intensity is increased, we see that V, E, V, O, 2 gradually declines and then starts to rise. And the point at which it starts to rise, we would demarcate as the gas exchange threshold, or GET. And then what we're looking at is the V, E, V, C, O, 2 response, the white circles, and you can see now that carries on declining and then levels out and then itself starts to increase. And you can have a debate about where that increase starts. Uh, not people often do. But here we see another increase. So beyond that point, the VVCO2 is increasing. And that point we call the respiratory compensation point. So what's happening here is at GET, the uh, ventilation is increasing out of proportion with VO2. And that's most likely due to the bicarbonate buffering of lactate, which increases uh, the VCO2. But that also further stimulates ventilation. Now, when you see an increase in v, VCO2, that's where minute ventilation is increasing out of proportion with carbon dioxide production. And that's likely because blood pH is still falling, and therefore that's a further stimulus to breathing over and above the bicarbonate buffering of lactate, which produces CO2. And therefore you get a further increase in ventilation. Now again, these are quite difficult as well. They're easier to spot than the uh, minute ventilation plot, but they're not always uh, that easy to spot. So what we typically do is we use these estimates to then set up a V-slope method of uh, gas exchange threshold detection. And what you do is you simply take the uh, data underneath what you think the gas exchange threshold is, and you fit a, a line through that, and you take the data above the gas exchange threshold, but below the respiratory compensation point, and fit a line through that. And you do that with the carbon dioxide and oxygen uptake data. So here's the S1 slope, so the data below the gas exchange threshold. There's the S2 slope between the gas exchange threshold and the respiratory compensation point. And then simply you determine the intersection of those lines. This is about two and a half litres per minute. And that will give you your gas exchange threshold. You can then read off the power output associated with that. Remembering, of course, that if you're doing a ramp test, you need to ramp correct that for the lag in VO2, which is usually about two thirds of the ramp rate. So in this case, it's a 30 watt per minute ramp. So you'd remove uh, or you'd reduce the estimated power output of gas exchange threshold by 20 watts to give you your estimated gas exchange threshold power output. And so, the lactate threshold and its equivalents provide the boundary between the moderate and the heavy intensity domains. That's your first threshold. 
What about the heavy severe domain boundary? Well, you can do it in one of two ways. You can either do it bottom up or you can do it top down. And by bottom up, I mean we use the maximal steady state, and in this case, the maximal lactate steady state. So what you see here is a plot of blood lactate against time. And what we've done is we've got a trained runner to run at four different speeds for 30 minutes. And we've measured blood lactate every five minutes, and we're looking for a steady state. So what we typically do is take the 10th minute and the 30th minute, and if there's no increase in blood lactate or an increase less than one millimolar over that period of time, we consider that a metabolic steady state. Now you can do this in various ways. You can first estimate where you think the maximal lactate steady state is, perhaps by taking the respiratory compensation point and then simply starting them at that. And if you see a non-steady state response, you reduce the power or you reduce the speed. If you don't see, uh, if you don't see a non-steady state response, then you increase it until the person demonstrates no steady state behavior. So let's just keep it simple and say we started at 16 kilometers per hour and then we increased it. So you can see at 16 kilometers per hour, we have a steady state. We have a steady state at 17. We have a steady state at 18, although there seems to be the beginnings of, of the lactate threshold starting to go. But at 19 kilometers per hour, we have non-steady state behavior. So in this case, we would call the maximal lactate steady state 18 kilometers per hour. So no problem there. Why is it bottom up? Well, because you take that as your maximal lactate steady state, you're admitting it's a steady state. And so what you're essentially saying is you're identifying the upper boundary of the heavy intensity domain. And that's what you use for your maximal steady state measurement. You can do it top down as well. And the way you do it top down is by establishing somehow the critical power. Here's how you do it conventionally. Essentially what you do is four separate exercise bouts to task failure above the critical power. Now you don't know where the critical power is, so what we typically do is we set uh, power outputs, in this case in cycling we're setting power outputs. We usually use 60% delta, 70% delta, 80% delta, and the maximal ramp power. And the reason we do that is so 60% delta is 60% of the difference between the gas exchange threshold and VO2 max. So that should put you above the critical power, which typically occurs at about 40 to 50% delta using that, that same parlance. So what we've done here is we've done that, and you can see uh, we have uh, about two minutes of, of exercise before task failure at just under 400 watts, and we have nearly 10 minutes of exercise here uh, at, well, it's going to be about 300 watts there. And what we do is we simply apply a mathematical function to, that's a hyperbolic function, and that will then give us with an asymptote, and that asymptote is the critical power. Now what that asymptote really tells us is at what point does the behaviour of severe intensity exercise cease to apply. So you're using severe intensity responses or severe intensity performance in this case to predict where that kind of thing would stop. And so what you're really doing with critical power is establishing the lower boundary of the severe intensity domain. So if you think about it that way, maximal lactate steady state gives you the upper boundary of the heavy intensity domain. Critical power should give you the lower boundary of the severe intensity domain. And that means that those two values don't always match up. And in fact, critical power will be typically somewhat higher than the maximal lactate steady state for that reason. Critical power does give you other things. If you're interested in how you're going to perform in the severe domain, of course, you can use the model or the mathematical function to predict that. So it's a little bit more information rich if you're exercising in the severe domain, whereas you might tend to want to use the maximal lactate steady state if you're wanting to look at what the envelope of the heavy intensity domain is, how high you, you need to go before you exceed it. Uh, you might want to do that if you're a marathon runner, for example, where you're not expecting to spend a long time, if any time at all, in the severe domain. So how does all this kind of work together and fit together with exercise intensity domains and training zones and the like? Well, here we have uh, a fairly simple table showing them. So we have the lactate threshold as the boundary between the moderate and the heavy domain. Then you have the maximal steady state or the critical power being the boundary between the heavy and severe domain. We don't have an equivalent threshold for the severe and extreme domain, but you can work it out from just plotting the VO2 response. But notice here we see 
um, quite a wide range of percentages of VO2 max. Um, and you really want to take this with a massive pinch of salt because this varies quite a lot. In fact, to be perfectly honest, if you are using percent VO2 max to estimate exercise intensity, you're doing it wrong because you're not taking these metabolic thresholds into account and you could be uh, performing a study or setting training zones where you actually straddle a threshold in a number of different athletes or a number of different participants and you get very divergent responses. So that is to be avoided. Um, now in training parlance, uh, particularly things like polarized training parlance, moderate intensity exercise is zone one, heavy intensity exercise zone two, and severe intensity exercise zone three. Now there is a, a five zone training model as well and there's also the four training levels of the former British Cycling Federation, but you can, uh, you can work out what these things are from uh, the descriptions I've just made. Now this all looks nice and tidy, but in reality that's not how humans work. This is what humans look like when you do a ramp test, and you can see here the moderate intensity domain, the heavy intensity domain. See how large and wide the severe extreme domains are. So the severe domain can be anything up to, in this particular case, 400 watts and then the extreme domain is beyond that. And look how much of the exercise intensity spectrum is non-steady state and unsustainable. So this is the maximum power you deliver in a sprint. This is me, by the way, so that's how I know how much power I can generate. Look at where VO2 max is in comparison to that. And look at where critical power is. So only about one third, a quarter to one third of your power spectrum is sustainable for anything uh, like 15 minutes or so, which is kind of incredible when you think about it. But it does mean that when you do moderate intensity exercise, you can sustain hours of exercise in the moderate domain. You can, you can sustain perhaps up to an hour of, perhaps up to two hours of exercise in the heavy domain. You can survive for minutes in the severe domain and mere seconds in the extreme domain. So that gives you some impression of, of how humans and indeed other animals are actually built. So. The maximal lactate steady state and the critical power, these are what provide the boundary between the heavy and severe domains. And so that is your second threshold. So a couple of take home messages. There are two important physiological thresholds in my view. The first is the threshold between the moderate and heavy domain, usually the lactate threshold and its equivalents. And then there's the heavy severe intensity domain threshold the maximal steady state, which is identified as maximal lactate steady state or critical power. Now, I shouldn't neglect to mention the functional threshold power. Um, so there you go, I've just mentioned it. And the validity and reliability of uh, these measures is based on the ability of them to estimate the boundary that you're interested in and do so consistently. And training zones, when you use them, can and they should map on to these intensity domains, and for the most part they do. If you look at historically uh, the four levels of the BCF and the, the polarized training zones, they do approximately, approximately map onto these intensity domains. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for your attention, and uh, it's customary to say hit that like and subscribe button, but you can do that if you want. I also have a number of papers uh, which are relevant to this, which I've included in the description to this video. So thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.